the film is called Cartoonist Foot Soldiers of, of Democracy. Uh, do you agree with that title? Well, it's a French film, first of all. It's in English, but it is a French film. And in France, uh, political cartooning is much more, uh, much more uh, important and much more appreciated than it is in this country. Uh, in Europe, I would say it, it is. The title is probably not something that we'd use in the United States or with the foot soldiers of democracy. But, you know, uh, most Americans think of cartoons as something that's supposed to be funny, Mickey Mouse and uh, silly stuff. But the film is making a, a case that being a cartoonist is of very important, uh, has high importance for, for a democracy. Do you, do you agree with that? And, and if you Well, do, I'd you... like to agree with it. It's good for business, but in, in fact, it's, cartoons are, are much more important in countries where languages are a challenge or where there's a lot of different languages. In that film, there is a, a, a part about my, my friend uh, Demi Anglais, and he is in uh, Burkina Faso. And Burkina Faso is a country in Western uh, Africa. It has within its, it's not the largest country, it has 60 languages within, within the country about half of which aren't even written. So in his newspaper, which runs a cartoon on the front page every day, uh, people get the idea of what the, even if they don't know what the characters are supposedly saying, they get the idea of who is an evil uh, dictatorial general in charge of a country and who isn't. Do you feel that there's some certain concepts or emotions that are better delivered through cartooning than through prose, for instance, or editorial writing? Well, it's, it's a shorter take. Cartoon usually gets about maybe uh, maybe 10 seconds for somebody to look at and figure out what's going on and then laugh at it or pass it on. Whereas they, otherwise they would have to sit and, and read and get through the introductory paragraphs and then go to the main part and then hang in there until the to the story and conclusion. We don't have to do that with the cartoon. It's, it's kind of a confection. It's, uh, it's a reward for having paid attention to the news. Do you feel that you've seen a change o over your career in terms of how people are, are reading in general? I mean, people do make the, the comment that we're, with each passing year, becoming more of a visual communication society. Um, have, have you seen that? Well, paper newspapers are not the, the force they used to be, and that's too bad. But the the uh, uh, internet, of course, now allows people to have cartoons everywhere. And for me to do a cartoon about a, a world subject, not only would it be more readily understood because of because you can read the news about Burkina Faso, for example, um, I wouldn't recommend it myself. Yeah, but you could you could get cartoons that are there and and and, re and react to them. It also shows our worldwide ignorance of what's going on because we, we read about things and we wonder how did, you know, how did how did that happen? Why wasn't I told before? Has it been common for you to get pushback from your editors about oh, this cartoon is a little? little too edgy, pushing a, a little too far, or at, at this point, have is it more a case of you're, you're allowed to, to print whatever fits within your, your vision? Well, that's sort of where the internet comes in, because you can do it, you can send it, and if they want to print it, it's, it's, their, you know, it's their decision to make uh, all, all on their own. Uh, and if they don't print it, well, then you know, we have something the next day. And so you can put it on your own website. I now work through a, a, uh, a syndicate, the uh, Washington Post Writers Group, or the Washington Post Syndicate, and we we send, they send out everything, and it's about I think it's about six hundred papers subscribed to it, and they they can use the cartoons if they want to, if they don't want to, they don't have to. Do you do you feel? that at this moment our democracy is in, in danger? 
Um, or do you see this in, in a context of, of degrees uh, based on experiences in other countries or experiences that cartoonists have in other countries? I, uh, well, I, I, I think that's true that, that we are now probably uh, in the hands of, uh, of, this, uh, of in, in Trump and, and his people who think that a, a more fascistic state where one guy's in charge and he tells everybody what to do. In some countries, that might work, but it's not going to work here because if Americans have one characteristic, it's that they don't do whatever you tell them to do, they, they won't do it. And it's, a, it's they, they want to be independent, they want to make up their own minds, they're told that they're free to do what they want, and they are. So it's, it's not going to work here. It's not like as it might work in countries with a long history of doing what they're told. Um, I don't have to name one, but you can figure out who they are. And the, a culture of obedience, that's not what we have. Does that, does that give you some sort of strange hope? Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I don't really know what, I mean, what I hope for is a, that I hope for the continued confusion, which I think we're going to have. And uh, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing. We are we are a, a raucous and somewhat obnoxious people, and we uh, we don't do what we're told. Do you feel that the role of a political cartoonist is is different in the United States than it is in some other countries? Well, the role is to get people to think and to be provocative. Uh, we also have, a, a, you know, editors and, and newspaper publishers who really want to stay in business, and they don't want to, they don't want to make anyone angry. They, one of the developments over the last 30, 40 years has been cities that only have one newspaper left, and they, they try to have place for everybody to come and express their opinion or express an opinion. Uh, that might work. It doesn't make for very interesting newspapers. I have to say that the Vermont papers, the, 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 the fight always used to be, not the fight, but the, the argument always was between the Rebel Herald and the Burlington Free Press. The Burlington Free Press was a very Republican, uh, business-oriented, and the Herald, because it was a kind of a was more of a working town paper, it was scrappier and uh, uh, more, more democratic. It was a, uh, it was a blue collar town and Burlington was much more, much more moneyed. We moved to Vermont in the early 90s and probably a lot of people have this feeling remembering the free press being a much more substantial, thicker paper than it is today. That can probably be said for most print yeah. Well, they had they have more reporters for one thing, and they they don't have very many reporters, as many as they used to have. The paper is not put together in Vermont; it's put together in I think in Chicago and or in, or in New Jersey, um, and that is part of the technology. But it's also the part of if they get news stories in time and get it in and get it right, they don't care. Whereas other papers and other news sites, the, the Vermont Digger, for example, which is you know far and away one of the best uh, news sites in the state and, and maybe in all of New England, you know, has been able to f follow stories and get people to work. Uh, nobody goes into journalism for the money, except maybe Rupert Murdoch. The rest, other people do it because they like they like the, they like the work and they think it's important. It looks like this was written, drawn in, in 2018, nearly two years ago. Um, feels very germane to what people are talking about with concerns about the election that, that's coming up with mail-in ballots. I assume you feel like the, this is still a concern? Or, or can you remember the context in which you drew, drew this? Was this for the midterms in 2018? Uh, I, actually, I think we've run this cartoon about every four years. Because the same thing has gone on where uh, the vote, is, there's an attempt made 
to control the vote and uh, to the count and who can vote and I, I don't know it just it, it doesn't seem to be uh, people who who could be resisting this do it a little bit but not not very much and, you know the, the, the voting machines that were made by uh, the Diebold company turned out to be crooked and, and, uh, and fixable. So this, this kind of cartoon pointing this out, it's almost evergreen. You know, maybe digging, digging into the history, this has been an ongoing problem in terms of um, restricting people's access to, to voting. Um, this, this might not be unique to our time, even, even though it feels like it is. Not only unique not to our time, but not to us. Most, most countries where there is a vote, somebody tries to uh, manipulate the vote somehow or, or tells lies. The, the, the hard thing is that for Americans to understand is that they're not that different in a lot of ways. Uh, I always try to say that the figure that 18% of Americans have passports. That's all. That's not very many. And in other countries, in, in Germany and in, in European countries, everybody has a passport because they need it. And the only area, only general area of the world where people have less, a, a smaller percentage of passports is places like Africa or, or South America. My father was in World War II in the South Pacific. And he, he used to say that the United States had two great allies in this world the Atlantic and the Pacific. And we had to go out and look for wars and look for things to do if we wanted to, wanted to keep up. Uh, we, we weren't threatened by Canada or Mexico. And we had water on both sides, lots of it. And so why didn't we just uh, you know, mind our own business? Coming back to the film and, and the cartoonists that are, that are featured in there, in, for you and in being included in that film and then, and then watching it, um, did, do you feel a sense of kinship with the with the other cartoonists that are featured? Well, I, I also felt very fortunate. Most of the people in, in that film have had real, real harassment from the government. The fellow in China was put in jail for a while. Ones in, in the Soviet Union, Michel uh, uh, Slakovsky, he was uh, uh, jailed, and then he they put the word out that nobody was supposed to. Uh, print his stuff in Mexico, which is the worst place in the world, strangely, to be a, a journalist. More journalists are killed in, in, in Mexico, not by the government, but uh, than any place else in the world. So those were people who really had serious uh, problems, were beaten up and dragged out of their houses at, at, at gunpoint. So I, I, I felt, well, I sort of have, have a... a comparatively easy life. And I believe the film was was made in um, in 2015. Now this wasn't harassment by a government, but um, of a different sort. So the Charlie Hebdo t attack was, I think, January yeah. of 2015. Did that change at all your your impression of of the work that cartoonists are doing in, in other countries and the, and the danger and importance of it? Yeah, certainly the, the risks that other, my fellow cartoonists, uh, that, that, they, uh, that they take uh, is, is rather amazing. We now, we now know more collectively because of the internet and because of the speed which a cartoon gets across uh, without, any, without any language. Uh, they, they have become much more important, but because they're more powerful, they're also more uh, at risk. In the film, there was the woman who made a Facebook page, I think is in Tunisia, uh, yes. she was right. the cat, right. and it was just kind of exploded, and then, um, you know, she, she was amazed by how quickly that, that became a thing for her. Well, it means that we can also go after other subjects. And Usually, the, the cartoons back in the, in the in the in those days would be the cartoon would be about the pol political figure saying something or doing something, or, you know. And now we can sort of do much more research to find out. Well, 
just to find out you know, what the Resolute Desk actually looks like and what certain people in the in the Congress actually actually look like. And uh, uh, so you can do that kind of research immediately and accurately, where you couldn't do that before. Now, whether it makes you a better artist, I, I don't know. Because when you sit down to do a cartoon, of course, you, there's a piece of white paper. There's nobody there to, to draw from. Uh, and it's very helpful to have any, anything you want come up on your computer screen and you can draw from that. Whether it's interior of the, uh, of the government buildings or whether it's ships or motorcycles or some of the things, bicycles, some of the things that are difficult to draw or human anatomy. Uh, all of, all of that you know, just enriches whatever the drawing is. Are you are you drawing essentially one cartoon per day? Yes. And are are those inspired uh, each day, or do you have a sense of how far you're working ahead? Well, it, it all depends on whether or not uh, you know there's a there's a story coming along, and usually with Trump, of course, there's something every something every day or something twice a day. I remember I was going to take the day off a little while ago, and I thought nothing's going to happen. It was in the middle of some kind of a vi- middle mid midsummer vacation, and then Stephen Miller got married, which uh, was just who would marry Stephen Miller? I mean, you have to be you have to be crazy, but so I had to run and do something about that. Well, I think we all learn. It doesn't make any difference if you're a cartoonist or a painter or a writer or, or a, a baseball player. You learn from the people who have gone before. I mean, my my admiration is greatest for for Pat Oliphant and for, for uh, Herbert Block, and but even going back for uh, Bill Malden and and I'm, I'm going to not say a name that I'll think about later on, and all the way back to one of the great. Uh, Artist was a German artist named Heinrich Klee, K L E Y. The guy was so good that it's actually very depressing to look at his work. Uh, he, he's just marvelous. His books, see his sketchbooks have been reprinted. Are there any of the cartoonists that are featured in in the film that you feel, in particular, are inspirations to you? Oh yeah, oh sure. They, well, they all are because. It's against the relative difficulty of a political situation within the uh, within within your country, within the country. So if if it's really difficult, then if you can get anything done, it's pretty it's pretty amazing. On the other hand, if it's easy like it is in the United States, well, maybe not so much. Might it become harder to do this work in the United States if if political things continue? Um, in an area that that feel um, undemocratic, I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna. I think it'll be easier because of the and more tempting because of the uh, internet, in which you can do a drawing and you don't have to wait and go through a, an editorial board. Or you can just put it on, and maybe ten people will see it. Maybe they'll send it on to uh, other people, and, and thousands will see it. So the idea of, well, should I do it because it's funny uh, or it's trenchant? Yeah, sure, do it. Yeah. I'll share one, one more. I mean, Donald Trump is not the first president with an adversarial relationship right. to the press. Um, and Nixon's not the only one either. <laughs> tell, tell me what you were trying to say with this drawing. Well, the famous quote... Attributed to Mark Twain, and there's some question about whether he ever said that. Do not pick a fight with people who buy ink by the barrel. It's it's not terribly serious quote, but it's quite true that the, that the media has in its own uh, within its own power structure the ability to do all sorts of things. It doesn't it doesn't have to uh, abide by any rule. Th- this drawing illustrates uh, one of the. One of the questions is when you are you doing a drawing for something that is about to happen, is happening, or has just happened. And in this case, if you you try to shoot the media, it, it just leaks ink. It just shoots ink, ink back at you. I like this. I like this drawing quite well. 
I guess my question is around whether journalism plays a greater role as it used to in in public opinion. I think it. I think it does. And look at the different forms of journalism. I mean, not just the internet, but how much television is out there. There's more more television hours that are going out than ever before. More comedy, more commentary, uh, and, and stronger commentary. More more newspapers are being started every year, which is an amazing figure. More are being printed every year. You would think it would be less, but that's, that's not from what I've read. It's, it's not just uh, MSNBC on one side and Fox on the other side. There's all sorts of gradations in between. And, you know, and he, and, and, and Trump, who used to call the Times, the New York Times, and the great failing New York Times, well, as usual, that was wrong, but, you know, the New York Times is bigger than it's ever been before. It has more people reporting than ever before. It has, it has greater uh, uh, reporting basis than ever before. Um, I think it's, it's actually greater. What he's done is make the New York Times greater than ever. And, and it's expensive, and it should be expensive. It's a, it requires a lot of people to put it all together. I guess my, my last question for you is a, a parochial question about um, the influence Vermont has on your work. No, I, I, I mean, I love the place. I don't know. And the only complaint I have is I don't, I don't think Vermonters know how lucky they are to be living here. I mean, the pe people that come up here from other states, Alabama, and, you know, we, we, we live a rather charmed life. I mean, there isn't any money. That's quite right. But that could be part of the charm. 